Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. My name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee Grand Rounds uh, for our department. Uh, back in October, we shifted our Grand Round Series to the webinar format, uh, and we've had presentations in, in several different areas uh, over the course of this academic year. Uh, I, I'd like to encourage you to, to fill out the evaluation that goes out in the Grand Rounds announcement. That's helpful uh, for me uh, in planning and in communicating with the presenter afterwards. One other thing, I'd like to encourage participants to write in comments or questions uh, in the comment box. And I'll, I'll keep track of that um, and go through those uh, at the end of the presentation today. Uh, so for today, uh, some background. Uh, you know, po policy decisions relate to health outcomes in many ways. Uh, including in the structure of health services, uh, but how are health outcomes of policies evaluated? What are the methods? Uh, how is day-to-day -day clinical work affected by policies? And today we have the opportunity to hear uh, from an expert in this area, Dr. Beth McGinty, to address this point, uh, specifically as these points relate to integrated behavioral health care policy, uh, which is a major focus of clinical and research work for many uh, of us in our department. Uh, some background on Dr. McGinty. Uh, Dr. McGinty completed a doctorate uh, in health policy and management at the Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. And after uh, staying on there, uh, was promoted in 2018 to associate professor. Uh, Dr. McGinty's work uh, is wide ranging within health policy and outcomes. And as it, just as an example of current work uh, is leading a research project uh, on how state medical cannabis laws relate to opioid use and pain management, and another project on quality improvement processes uh, to increase delivery of cardiovascular disease risk factor care in community mental health centers. Uh, Dr. McGinty uh, is Associate Director of the Johns Hopkins Alacrity Center for Health and Longevity and Mental Illness, and in 2020, uh, became co-director of the Center for Mental Health and Addiction Policy Research. Uh, uh, Dr. McGinty has also served on over 15 national task, task forces, uh, including currently on the Bipartisan Policy Center Behavioral Health Integration Task Force to develop federal policy recommendations uh, for improving integration of general medical and behavioral health care, which again is, is today's topic. Uh, so I'll stop there for now and turn it over to Dr. McGinty. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and thanks everyone for having me. Let me pull up my slides here. Okay, so as you just heard, I'm going to spend the next hour or so talking through integrated behavioral health care policy. Um, and I'm going to orient us around sort of three questions. What have we tried? What has worked? Um, and what is next? What have, we, what have we learned, maybe, instead of what, what has worked, is how I framed it here. I'm going to start with a brief introduction to integrated care. I'm not going to spend too much time here, as I really think of um, you all and the University of Washington and the Ames Center more broadly as sort of the locus of expertise on this topic, um, it, particularly collaborative care, which I really think is sort of the foundation for the large majority of our integrated care care efforts in the United States. So in terms of teeing up the problem here, in a nutshell, we know that mental illness is undertreated, the substance use disorder is certainly undertreated. We know we have considerable comorbidity of mental health and physical health conditions. You would think the way our system is structured that people either have mental health issues or physical health issues, which of course makes no sense when you're faced with actual people. Um, and we have a very fragmented system in the United States. Um, 
These principles are sort of relevant for both mental illness and substance use disorder, although most of the integrated care literature to date has focused on mental illness, and that's true in the policy space as well. So you'll hear when I talk us through the policy side of things that much of what we have tried to date is focused on mental health and general medical integration, and less so on the substance use disorder side, although there is, at the moment, quite a bit of policy action going on around medication treatment for opioid use disorder specifically. I'll mention some of that very briefly, but that's a totally separate grand rounds talk, so won't spend uh, too much time there. So as I said, you know, when I think about orienting myself toward integrated care and what we need to put a policy infrastructure or a policy ecology, as you'll hear me refer to it a little later on, in place to support, I think about the chronic care model, um, which is the foundation of the collaborative care model, the foundation of primary care medical homes, and really, in my view, the foundation in some way, shape, or form of integrated care writ large. And so, you know, we think about uh, collaborative care and the chronic care model as including key components around self-management support, delivery system redesign, decision support, clinical information systems, all in the spirit of supporting team-based care and um, productive interactions between um, patients and clinicians. Now, there's a, a pretty wide spectrum uh, out there in the real world on the ground of integrated care models. This is definitely not a one-size-fits-all type of scenario, and we're certainly not uh, in a world where, you know, every primary care practice is implementing high-fidelity collaborative care. So a couple of other common types of flavors of integrated care models, if you will, are screening brief intervention prevention and referral to treatment, which has actually been used more in the substance use um, world than in the mental health world, as well as consultation liaison type models. When we think about behavioral health integration, the field often um, separates sort of primary care-based integration, so integrating mental health services or substance use services into primary care or other general medical settings in some cases, versus specialty behavioral health-based integration, where we're focused on integrating physical health, care management, and care delivery into specialty mental health or substance use treatment programs. So on the specialty mental health-based side, um, these are often called behavioral health homes, seems to be a term that the literature is coalescing around to refer to these sorts of models that are focused on on integrating physical healthcare services into the specialty behavioral health sector. In reality, what is being increasingly called a sort of behavioral health home model in the literature is a wide variety of models ranging from sort of really fully integrated financing and delivery to some sort of basic care coordination and referral oriented models. So I find this dichotomy between primary care based integration and specialty behavioral health based integration uh, sort of false and a bit puzzling in that the whole point is integration. So why are we focusing sort of on a primary care side and on a behavioral health side? I understand why we do that in practice because it's the way our system is set up. But nonetheless, I sort of struggle to think about it uh, academically. And so I think it's helpful to think about integration on a spectrum um, and the great work by um, folks at Columbia, I, I think is really indicative of this sort of spectrum or continuum in their words idea. I've highlighted here a paper led by um, Matthew Goldman that lays out the continuum based framework they've developed for translating behavioral integration to primary care settings. I would assert and um, have talked uh, to Dr. Goldman and he agrees that really this continuum could sort of be 
flipped from right to left um, or left to right, they flipped around and could also apply to integration of um, primary care services and behavioral health settings. So very briefly, you know, the idea with this continuum is that it sort of lays out some key domains and components of those domains and then acknowledges that uh, they can be more or less integrated on a spectrum in a given setting. Um, so here's that spectrum of preliminary, intermediate, advanced um, integration around, um, in this case, sort of the preliminary uh, domain is identification of folks with behavioral health systems. It's not systematic, it's ad hoc. The intermediate level introduces some systematic screening, um, and the advanced level uses more advanced population health management through stratification type approaches. So I think when I think about policies to support integrated care, which uh, is where I'll go and stay in about two slides from now, I find it very helpful to sort of consistently remind myself of what are the core elements to the extent that we've been able to identify them from these multi-component integrated care inter interventions what are the core components of effective integrated care models? And the reason I find that important from a policy perspective is that, you know, the whole point of policies is to incentivize and support implementation of those core components. So the table on this slide is from a paper I led with um, Dr. Domit that was focused on this this very topic, policies to support integrated care. Um, and I'm sure it looks very familiar to those of you who do work in the collaborative care world, um, but thinks about what are some core process of care elements that are common across effective integrated care models. Proactive and systematic patient identification and connection to treatment, team-based care, information tracking and exchange, continual care management, measurement-based stepped care, self-management support, linkages with community and social services, and systematic quality improvement. Um, the asterisks by self-management support and linkages with community social um, and social services are there because um, this was a, a paper that was used as part of a National Academies forum. And we were asked by the organizers to identify sort of which of these uh, components might be part of more of a Cadillac model for a sort of larger, maybe better resourced system, and which of them were sort of really needed to do any types of integrated care. It was painful to put asterisks by any of these, but those are the two that we ended up with within the process of care market. And then, of course, you know, in order to implement any of those processes, there have to be structures in place. And policies are often tied more directly to structures than processes, although they sort of need to facilitate both in an ideal world. And so when we think about key structural elements, you know, we need to have the staffing of that multidisciplinary care team in place. We need to have clinical information systems that allow us to do all those processes on the prior slide in place, like shared EHRs and population-based registries, um, patient-centered care plans, decision support protocols, and of course, and here's where we do the transition to policies, the financing mechanisms. So moving now into the policy domain, we've got large bodies of literature at this point showing, you know, in particular that the collaborative care model can be effective in supporting delivery of evidence-based treatment for people with depression as well as other mental illnesses and in improving symptom management for folks. And we've shown that again and again in the clinical trial context and yet have struggled to scale up the model in 
in a big way in the real world um, and to scale it up with high fidelity in a way that leads to improved patient outcomes. And that's very much true of all of the various flavors of integrated care models are out there, including the sort of behavioral health home type model on the specialty mental health side as well. So what have we tried in terms of policies to date? I'm going to highlight what I think are four uh, big things that we've tried uh, and that should give a flavor of the types of policy initiatives that we have tried to date. I don't mean to imply that this is a fully comprehensive list of every single uh, policy out there, um, but these should give you a good sense of the types of things we've tried so far and what we have learned about them. So I'll start with CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Behavioral Health Integration Billing Codes. I'll talk about primary care medical home reimbursement strategies, accountable care organizations, and Affordable Care Act health home waivers. Now, the key thing that I'll highlight before I go into a little bit more detail about each of those is that all of these are strategies to overcome payment barriers. So I would assert that most of our policy work around integrated care to date has focused on reimbursement. It's focused on overcoming payment barriers. And the central payment barrier here is that historically in our fee-for-service model, we have not had reimbursement mechanisms for services like care coordination or care management, which take time and skill and structures um, that, of course, need to be financed if they are going to get done. So I'm going to spend a, a bit more time on the CMS behavioral health integration billing codes than on some of the others, because I think this is a really nice case study, both of, sort of what we've tried and what some of the big challenges are. So CMS introduced these behavioral health integration billing codes um, for Medicare beneficiaries, although they're now used in some but not all state Medicaid programs and have also been adopted by some um, commercial insurers as well in uh, 2017. And early research looking at uptake of these codes, which allow providers, primary care providers, to bill for integrated care services. I'll tell you a little bit more what that looks like exactly in a minute, if you're not familiar. The initial research showed that uptake of these codes was, was very low. Um, so this study by Dory Cross and colleagues found that you know, less than 1%, 0.1% of Medicare beneficiaries with mental illness or substance use disorder had a behavioral health integration billing code in 2017, 2018. And there's been some subsequent work that has tried to identify some of the barriers to uptake here. That study was looking at uptake in the first years that the codes exist. Some of it's probably a learning curve. You know, folks aren't used to billing these codes yet, um, but there's some other barriers as well. And so two big ones that um, I think are worth considering. One is that reimbursement through these codes flows entirely to the billing general medical provider, usually a primary care provider, but other general medical providers can use these too. And so the onus is on the general medical provider to set up strategies like contractual strategies or ledger transfers to pay their behavioral health partners. So they have to have a behavioral health partner in place, but it's also their responsibility to figure out sort of how to pay that partner. In addition, in order to be eligible to bill these codes, practices have to already have integrated care process and structure elements in place. So here's an example. In order to bill for initial psychiatric collaborative care management, the required elements includes things like 
you have to have done outreach to and engagement in treatment of a patient directed by the treatment physician. Okay, that one seems doable. Done an initial assessment, including administration of validated rating scales. So that means you have to have some system in place in your practice to be using those validated rating scales. Review by the psychiatric consultant with modifications of the plan if recommended. That means you have to have a psychiatric consultant on staff in order to bill. Entering patient in a registry and tracking patient follow-up. So you have to have a registry. And then provision and brief interventions using evidence-based techniques such as behavioral activation, motivational interviewing, or other strategies. So you have to have someone on the team who is able to deliver those interventions. So that involves some staffing and some health IT that many places might not have, making them unable to bill this code. So concerningly, the uptake of these behavioral health integration codes seems to be lower than the uptake of other new Medicare billing codes for care management. So for example, a study published in JAMA a couple of years back found that about 9% compared to that 0.1% I just showed you for the BHI codes, about 9% of Medicare beneficiaries had tradition, transitional care management codes, and 2.3% had chronic care management codes. So still quite low, not um, fabulous uptake there either, but more uptake for these types of care management codes, which were introduced around the same time as behavioral health integration billing codes, um, than these codes designed specifically to support behavioral health integration. The per beneficiary per month reimbursement structure that these codes pay practices through is pretty modest. So this is an example of the summary from 2019 of what those um, actual reimbursement amounts looked like. So you can imagine that this is not perhaps enough of a financial incentive for places that don't already have some of those expensive structural elements like integrated IT systems and registries and multidisciplinary care teams in place to sort of put them in place. Uh, the, the financial incentive might be too low. And we've seen from other efforts that similar modest levels of payments to cover care coordination and management have also failed to result in meaningful integration. So two big federal demonstration programs, they're both advanced primary care demonstrations that included behavioral health integration, the comprehensive primary care demonstration and the multi-payer advanced primary care demonstration, both used levels of reimbursement per Pretty similar to what you see on this table for the CMS behavioral health integration billing codes, somewhere between $30 and $200 per member per month, depending on what the, um, what the service is. And in those attempts, uh, through again, federal demonstrations to integrate behavioral health care into primary care, we also saw evidence that this type of financial incentive just wasn't enough to result in meaningful behavioral health integration. So another strategy that has a growing amount of literature in regards to behavioral health integration is primary care medical home reimbursement strategies. So PCMHs, of course, are not entirely focused on mental health. They're not a behavioral health integration mechanism per se, um, but they are focused on implementing the chronic care model, and the majority of them do include some level of attempt, at least, at behavioral health integration. And there's some evidence, although not nearly as much as we see for collaborative care, that primary care medical homes do have the potential to improve care for people with mental illness, including folks with um, serious mental illness. Marisa Domino's work um, with the North Carolina Medicaid PCMH program has shown some 
promising results. So under the 2015 CHIP Reauthorization Act, PCMHs are eligible for higher fee-for-service Medicare payments, um, which was you know, designed to help incentivize adoption of PCMHs. And in 2017, the National Commission on Quality Assurance introduced a behavioral health integration distinction program as part of its recognition initiative for primary care medical homes. The effects of either of those policies in the case of the CHIP Reauthorization Act and um, programs, I suppose, on the part of the NCQA distinction program, neither of them has been rigorously evaluated in terms of how they have affected behavioral health integration specifically, um, but there is uh, the potential that those uh, might facilitate adoption. So accountable care organizations like primary care medical homes are of course not specifically designed to integrate general medical and behavioral health care, but they have the potential to incentivize integration through shared savings and quality benchmarks. Um, to date though, the results on how ACOs have affected um, mental health and substance use care are pretty disappointing. Um, we have evidence showing that there really haven't been meaningful effects of ACOs on mental health or substance use access and quality. And that seems to be due to two, uh, I think, fairly intuitive issues in the way that ACOs have been structured, which are, you know, things that could be solved with policy policy change, potentially. One is the lack of alignment between payment and performance metrics, um, ACO performance metrics uh, on which shared savings um, and losses are in some cases are based, really haven't focused much on behavioral health aside from the psychiatric readmission measure. Part of that is because that we really lack good, valid behavioral health performance measures. Um, so there's uh, sort of a, an upstream driver of that problem. Uh, we also have evidence that there's been very limited inclusion of behavioral health specialty providers in ACOs. And so if your behavioral health specialty folks don't have the same incentives around shared savings and performance metrics as your general medical providers, I think, again, it's reasonably intuitive that we're not going to see big changes in care integration. So I just alluded to the importance of performance metrics and the fact that, um, you know, when, when I say, well, part of what's happening in terms of ACOs not having major effects on behavioral health care is that, you know, we're not measuring it. If you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. Um, and then people say, well, we don't have good metrics, which, which is true. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of work going on in this area, led in particular by Harold Pincus and, and his group. Um, and Unfortunately, the progress here has been limited. So I, I was part of a, a large sort of Delphi panel, expert consensus panel that Harold and colleagues ran uh, to try to identify sort of evidence-based measures of integration. And we really came up short um, without, without strong evidence-based measures. And so at this point, I think the thinking is you know, well, we need to work on developing sort of validated measures of integrated care that we can show are associated with improved health outcomes among people, or at the very least among improved care delivery outcomes. But perhaps we should also be thinking in the context of integrated care about a much simpler strategy around stratifying existing general medical performance metrics for folks with mental illness. So that doesn't necessarily help us in terms of incentivizing better mental health and addiction care, but it could help us in terms of incentivizing better general medical care for people with behavioral health conditions, which we also know um, has, has quite significant deficits, especially in people with serious mental illness who have 10 to 20 years premature mortality due to 
largely poorly treated cardiovascular disease and other physical health conditions. And so I think that one thing we're going to see in the performance metric front is some efforts to require ACOs to report stratified metrics um, to show, you know, are you only improving this, this metric in people without mental illness, or are you improving it in people with mental illness as well? And then finally, the, the fourth uh, sort of payment policy initiative that I'll allude to here are Affordable Care Act health home waivers. This is an area where, where I've done a bunch of work. Um, so the Affordable Care Act allowed state Medicaid programs to um, apply for a waiver, which would facilitate their creation of a, quote, Medicaid health home program that essentially, in a nutshell, allow them to bill Medicaid for care coordination and management services, which they were not previously able to do. And states could build a Medicaid health home program for um, a variety of high cost, high need populations. Many of them focused on mental illness and did both uh, sort of primary care based integration through these waivers, but also, and this is what I focus on with the map on this slide, used these waivers to scale up this behavioral health home model of integrating general medical care into specialty mental health systems. Um, this waiver following SAMHSA's um, public behavioral health integration sort of grant demonstration program, these waivers were really the first larger scale scale up of this type of program. Um, so you can see here the, the blue states on this, maps, this map are the ones that used Affordable Care Act Medicaid health home waivers to create, quote, behavioral health homes. So as I said, this is an area where my group has done a good amount of work with Maryland's program. Maryland used the Medicaid health home waiver to create um, these behavioral health homes in uh, psychiatric rehabilitation programs. We have a very robust psychiatric rehabilitation system in the state. Psych rehab programs in Maryland have a long-standing history of coordinating and managing mental health and substance use care for clients. And so through this waiver, they also started coordinating and managing um, general medical care. What that looks like on the ground is quite diverse. Um, some of the 60 or so individual sites that implemented these programs have co-located primary care clinics. Some of them are doing purely sort of facilitated referral models. And there's a lot of things on the continuum um, in between. And so what we've found through our work on this model um, is that we've seen some small but positive effects on screening, including cancer screening, on transitional care and readmissions, so reductions in readmissions, um, general medical readmissions in this case, among people with serious mental illness participating in these programs, reductions in emergency department, although not inpatient um, utilization, but these improvements haven't, at least yet, translated into improved quality of cardiovascular care among health home participants in these programs, which is the ultimate goal uh, of the programs as laid out in the, in the state plan applying for the waiver, the motivation being the significant premature mortality driven by cardiovascular disease among people with serious mental illness. So this Affordable Care Act, you know, waiver mechanism that again provided a, a reimbursement mechanism, a per member per month reimbursement mechanism that looks pretty similar in many ways to those CMS behavioral health integration codes, except in this case, it's the specialty mental health programs that are billing to do the integration as opposed to the general medical programs, um, seems to have had some small benefits, but again, hasn't translated into the health improvements that we would hope for. 
we've also done quite a bit of work on trying to understand the implementation barriers and from my perspective, what those implementation barriers mean for policy. And so two things that I'll highlight that stand out to me about Maryland's ACA waiver model is that two big challenges that emerged were the fact that uh, there was no financial incentive built in for external primary care providers to collaborate with the specialty mental health programs. So all of the financing flows entirely um, to the specialty mental health program. So as with those primary behavioral health integration codes, it was sort of up to, in this case, the psych rehab programs in Maryland to set up financing arrangements with primary care and other general medical partners, which just wasn't feasible for them in most cases to do. The other thing that we saw was that the specialty mental health programs were really not equipped to conduct the type of population health management needed to identify folks in their panels who had cardiovascular risk factors and who needed um, care management and monitoring. They didn't have the integrated EMRs. They didn't have the population health registries that allowed them to do that. So that suggests, you know, a couple of potential policy uh, intervention points there in terms of needing reimbursement models that sort of reimburse everybody involved on the uh, integrated care team, both the general medical and the specialty behavioral health side, and perhaps some incentives for health IT adoption, um, particularly for specialty mental health-based integration models. You know, we've seen um, some pretty successful federal incentive programs for adoption of EMRs and other types of health IT on the general medical side, but but many of those uh, policies creating incentive programs like the HIT Act have excluded um, specialty mental health providers. And so then I'll end my, my bit here on uh, these Affordable Care Act health home waivers just by flagging that, that this work uh, on Maryland's waiver policy led our group to really start thinking about the policy ecology, that's a term I alluded to a few minutes ago, of integrated care. And this idea that reimbursement mechanisms alone are, are not enough. They are necessary. They're major progress. We used to have no way to reimburse care coordination and management, and now we do. Um, but they're not sufficient to sort of prompt adoption of these complex, effective integrated care. Um, so I think that's my first what have we learned take home point. I think we have also learned, as I alluded to a minute ago, that we need multi-payer financing arrangements to support both process of care and structural care or structural elements, excuse me, of integrated care models. So there's some thinking about, you know, can we do sort of bundled payments, maybe separate bundles for process of care and structured um, and structures. The structures are expensive, um, they involve startup costs, um, and we don't have good ways of financing them at this point. The accountability for whole person health point brings me back to um, the performance metrics idea. We sort of need models that hold providers accountable for both behavioral and physical health. And then I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I'll allude to it briefly. You know, there are also some, I, in my view, sort of low-hanging fruit policy barriers out there, um, like same-day billing limits, where some community health programs can't bill for both a behavioral health service and a um, physical health service on the same day. Behavioral health carve-outs get held up a lot as being potentially problematic for integrated care because by virtue of 
carving you know, behavioral health care out of an insurance plan, you are not coordinating. There's not a lot of evidence around that yet, but there is some. There are a couple of studies that do indeed suggest that carving out might create some barriers to integration intuitively, I think. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, this is a whole different talk, um, but when we think about integrating care for opioid use disorder into primary care, there are some real uh, barriers in the federal regulations um, around prescribing epipenorphine. Um, in particular, the Biden administration has a lot going on there. They're relaxing some of the waiver requirements um, as we speak. So I'll just say very briefly a little bit more about each of these points and then um, conclude and open it up for questions in the next three minutes or so. So I alluded to this idea of, of needing a policy ecology. And so like, what am I talking about? <laughs> policy ecology here. So the idea is that we need a whole group of policies, an ecology of policies uh, to support integrated care models. And reimbursement mechanisms are part of the ecology, but not all of it. Um, we also need things like accreditation policies, requiring multidisciplinary care teams, HIT policies, which I alluded to, um, going further upstream, health professions training policies, like requiring training in care coordination and management um, at the medical school stage. And in terms of thinking about overcoming barriers to that one-sided reimbursement issue I kept talking about, where in our current reimbursement mechanisms, all the money flows either to the primary care partner or to the behavioral health partner. Um, there are some promising models to get around that, that issue out there. The one that I'll highlight is the hub and spoke model, which has been used successfully um, prominently in Vermont in the opioid use disorder treatment context, but elsewhere as well where essentially there's a financing mechanism that um, establishes one sector as the hub, either primary care or specialty care, and then the other as the spokes. And the financing is structured in such a way that it flows directly to the hub and through the spokes without the hub having to set up its own ledger transfer or contractual arrangement. So as I alluded to briefly, this idea of supporting both process of care and structured care elements, one idea is uh, comes from the American College of Physicians, it's actually quite an old idea that's now getting some more play, more play is sort of suggested bundle or separate bundled payments for structural and process elements. Um, I think we can do a much better job incorporating performance measures that support whole person health into accountable care organizations and other global budgeting type models. And then finally, what's next? So incorporating those performance metrics, which I just said, I think we need to pay close attention to integration of behavioral health in advanced primary care models um, like CPC Plus, which is the next uh, iteration of the comprehensive primary care model. They're doing some innovative things in particular around population health management and health IT. They've got some um, vendors and consultants on board specifically trying to design health systems that would help with um, sort of population health management in the context of integrated care, which I think is a really big barrier in many health systems. So that demonstration, it's a federal demonstration, is ongoing. The evaluation is also ongoing, um, but that's one that I'm, I'm keeping my eye on. I think that I would be remiss in the moment in time that we're in, um, not to mention the potential of telehealth policy post COVID. We've seen enormous relaxing of telehealth policy in the context of COVID. I think at least some of that is likely to continue post COVID and it provides potentially some opportunities for integration where co-location might not be quite so important if we have policy structures in place that make it easy um, for sort of integrated care team delivery 
virtually. And then as I already alluded to, sort of the policy changes to support medication for opioid use disorder in um, primary care and other general medical settings is one where there's a lot of policy movement um, happening at the moment, mostly though around sort of relaxing very restrictive current federal policies as opposed to putting brand new, highly innovative policies in place. So relaxing some of the restrictions around the buprenorphine waiver um, and potentially thinking about whether methadone for opioid use disorder can be prescribed in the primary care setting. So I am going to stop there and maybe pull down my slides. Um, stop share, there we go. Although I can certainly pull them back up if helpful to refer to anything particular on there. But let me open it up to questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. McGinty. I really appreciate the presentation today. Um, and multiple qu uh, questions, a couple of questions came in. I'd like to encourage other participants to write in questions or comments. Uh, we have time to address them. One question came in regarding, uh, it was actually a series of, of comments, but ultimately related to sort of, sort of lack of a, a, what seems to be lack of a healthcare system for, for mental health care delivery. Um, how it sort of, maybe it breaks down in different ways, you know, at a state level, local level, federal level. And, and so the question is about how, how can uh, alignment of performance and payment metrics sort of go along with uh, there not being a system from which to develop such metrics. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is like the central issue in integrated care policy, right? Is we have a total chicken and egg problem in that we want to integrate, but we're starting with this totally fragmented system. And all of our financing and delivery policies are built for the fragmented system, <laughs> not for the integrated system. And so sort of where do we where do we start? Um, I think that, you know, my big picture answer there is that we are really seeing in my mind, what is going to be a continued shift towards accountable care type models, by which I mean ACOs, but also other sort of global budgeting type models. It's the direction that the world is going. And so uh, as we go in that direction, I think there are real incentives for the systems who are gonna be subject to global budgeting, like Maryland has a major global budgeting um, initiative going on now. And I think we're starting to see some of that in our state. They have major incentives to think about mental health care and to pull mental health care sort of into the system because many people, 50% of us at some point in our life have mental illness and are expensive and are, you know, it, it interacts with how we do with physical health conditions and uh, sort of causes causes financial pain to health systems in global budgeting type scenarios. So I think that that is the way to think about it is sort of what are the incentives for what I think of unfortunately as like the dominant general medical system that the behavioral health system is outside. What are the incentives for them to sort of envelop <laughs> um, specialty behavioral health, which of course there are some downsides to and that there are benefits of specialization. Um, you know, we, we sort of don't wanna, wanna get rid of some of the specialty expertise in the system. But I think thinking about uh, those incentives are, are the way to do it. Without those kinds of incentives, it, the fragmentation is never gonna disappear. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question related to the concept of performance metrics and risk stratification. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to see overall performance of specific populations, uh, one person wrote in. Can, can you talk more about that stratification, how, maybe how, uh, how, how it works in more detail? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, the general idea here is not a super complicated one, at least at this stage. You know, there's there's many examples out there of sort of very um, 
very nuanced risk stratification. But the idea here that I was alluding to, which has come mostly out of the behavioral health-based integration side, which is thinking a lot about how do we make sure that our clients, particularly with serious mental illness, um, are you know getting evidence-based care for their cardiovascular risk factors and other general medical conditions. The idea there is that, you know, it seems like low-hanging fruit for systems that are already required to report performance metrics and for whom payment is in some way tied to those performance metrics, for them to stratify those metrics by people with serious mental illness versus people without serious mental illness or perhaps people with mental illness writ large. There's a lot of devil in the details here in terms of like what exact ICD-9 codes are you using to um, identify those folks. Uh, but that is the general thinking, you know, when we do studies looking at the types of claims or EHR-based process of care metrics for general medical conditions, like, you know, did everybody with diabetes mellitus get their annual eye exam. Um, we see that people with serious mental illness, particularly those covered by Medicaid, do much, much worse on those metrics. And given that we know that there is some stratification there, um, the idea is if we required stratification and tied some payment to moving the dial in both groups, that could be beneficial. It hasn't been done yet, to my knowledge. Um, so I really do think there's a lot of details to work out. I don't mean to say like, oh, it's so easy. Um, just that the idea is, <laughs> is straightforward. And I think just uh, as others maybe are writing in questions to clarify this point from my so I can understand this. Uh, is it are you, is stratification suggesting that a group of individuals, however defined by specific serious mental illness or, or a larger group, maybe uh, it's okay for that clinic to have a lower proportion of those individuals meeting a certain benchmark? Or is it that that is a group that the clinic needs to demonstrate greater improvements in? Yeah, so those are the kinds of decision points that I think would need to be thought carefully about if tying payment to them. So I guess my initial thinking there, thinking on my feet a little bit, is that it would be quite problematic given that we know from existing research that if you do that stratification, people with serious mental illness are going to have much poorer measures of guideline concordant care, um, it would be quite problematic to say, you know, you're going to lose money immediately if you don't have uh, the same level of guideline concordance in people with serious mental illness as people without. I think you would want to set those payment benchmarks based more on sort of level of improvement um, with the ultimate goal of um, equality in terms of delivery of guideline concordant care. Uh, but I think it would be short-sighted and too blunt of an instrument to sort of require <laughs> that level of equality um, initially. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, so what, a follow-up question uh, regarding uh, noticing this with collaborative care and whole person care work. Uh, yep, yeah, more of a comment uh, from Sarah Barker at the AIM Center about noticing this uh, within collaborative care work and SMI population and wanting to demonstrate improvement in outcomes. Yep, okay. Uh, well, other, uh, other participants, I'd like to encourage any additional comments or questions. Um, and yeah, I guess one last, um, we think about uh, collaborative care work and trying to, uh, uh, you know, one important point that I think a lot of us have thought about is working with a champion within primary care clinics. Uh, and I, I wonder if that's, uh, 
something that you've seen in any, any research in uh, helping to identify sort of clinic champions? Uh, often it takes sustained work over time, not just an initial degree of enthusiasm about the work, but helping the, the sort of sustain the practice after some of the initial costs in either time or, or financially? Yeah, you know, I think champions are, are critical in this context and in other sort of implementation scale up efforts. I, I think that I would love to exist in a world where implementation of evidence based models like collaborative care was not wholly dependent on a strong champion. And I think that often it is right now, you really need someone in a leadership position and a position of power uh, who is willing to go that extra mile to, um, to prompt the, the delivery reforms within their clinic in order to get this done. And I think our job on the policy side is to think about like, can we incentivize and support clinics to do this without needing that kind of exceptional champion? I think implementation of anything will always be supported by having a champion. Um, and so I'm not by any means advocating against champions. And I think that in the world we live in, a champion is absolutely critical to, to, to doing this work. But I would sort of like, you know, one of my career goals is that maybe we'll have made some progress 25 years from now and not being entirely dependent on those, those types of exceptional leaders that just are never going to exist everywhere. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, so two questions came in uh, just during that time. One is uh, a question related to SBIRT, which is now reimbursed widely in many settings, but has not led to many strong results and outcomes. That's what, one question. Another is if there's any, uh, yeah, why don't we start with that for now? Yeah, so I mean, I think your question sort of uh, is my thoughts, basically. So it's widely reimbursed. Um, I think it's potentially promising in that, um, it has proven to be pretty feasible to implement. It doesn't have as many moving pieces as more complex models. And the types of brief interventions that can be implemented through SBIRT do have evidence supporting them in some cases in terms of prompting people to engage with treatment. Um, but yeah, as you said, you know, the rigorous clinical trials of SBIRT have shown no, um, no effects on sort of clinical outcomes on the, on the substance use side. So I think it's, a, it's sort of yet another um, promising model with sort of implementation problems. I suspect that... Um, there's enormous variation in sort of what the what the brief interventions look like. Um, that could be a fixable problem, but then we have clinical trials that have, you know, really um, rigid protocols about what those brief interventions look like, and those aren't aren't showing the the effects we want either. So, I think it's a model that um, needs more work and potentially. You know, uh, I hope this isn't the case, but in the field of implementation science, we're increasingly thinking about sort of de-implementing um, policies that maybe are incentivizing the wrong things. And it seems like with SBIRT, um, I don't know that we know yet. Uh, I won't go so far as to say we should stop reimbursing SBIRT, but it may be a case where we've scaled up the reimbursement ahead of the evidence. Well, thank you for your responses to these questions and comments that have come in and for the presentation today uh, in our Grand Round series. Uh, so we're, we're right at about one o'clock and thank you for the uh, participants for writing in and, and uh, Dr. McGinty, uh, again, thank you uh, for sharing your expertise and for presenting uh, today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Bye. Bye.